Hello friends! I'm sure it's no secret to anyone that people's taste preferences on our planet change incredibly quickly. In general, we can divide society into two main groups, proponents of healthy eating and fast food lovers. However, no one denies that fast food really saves time and effort in preparation, which is especially convenient when a person is in a hurry. And of course, fast food is tasty. Today, I'll tell you about Burger King, a fast food restaurant chain that is one of the fastest growing in the world. Burger King is popular due to its diverse and delicious menu, which is constantly updated, as well as a bonus system for customers. These unique advantages make this chain special. Every day, more than 11 million visitors come to Burger King restaurants around the world, which is not surprising given their famous taste, signature dishes and excellent value for money. Burger King was founded in 1954. The post-war period left its mark on American history, and as soon as the country overcame the financial crisis, a new demographic period began for entrepreneurs. It was during this time that many startup ideas were born, including family businesses like fast food restaurants. Our heroes, David Edgerton and James McLamour, were among such entrepreneurs. A little later, they opened the first Burger King restaurant, but I'll tell you more about that later. Let's get to know James Whitman McLemore a little better. He was born on May 30th, 1926, in New York City, and at the age of four, he moved to live with his grandmother in the countryside after the stock market crash, which led to his father losing his job. Later, his mother passed away from a heart attack. These difficulties only strengthened James, and he realized he could only rely on himself. He graduated from high school and enrolled in the School of Hotel Administration at Cornell University. He had only $1.11 in his pocket, which his father gave him. During his time at university, he served in the United States Navy, which gave him the opportunity to see the world. After graduating from university, he married Nancy Nicole, and they began planning their future together. Despite several unsuccessful attempts to find a job, they decided they wanted to create something of their own that would provide them not only with survival, but also with prospects for career advancement. McLemore's first job in the restaurant business was at the cafeteria of YM7, alongside Menton. Despite the immense responsibility, he was paid very little, only $250 per month, while overseeing about 30 employees, multiple banquet halls, the cafeteria, and a bakery. Though challenging, McLemore tried to find work in his field. This led him and his spouse to a small town, Wilmington, where only about 30,000 people lived at the time. Their move was fraught with problems from the start. On their first day, their car was broken into and all their valuables and money were stolen. Adding to this, McLemore suffered from severe back pain, alleviated only by hot showers. Despite his discomfort, he immediately started working at YM7 undertaking his new responsibilities. As the founder of Burger King later recalled, McLamour enjoyed the work. Under his leadership, the cafeteria transformed from an ordinary eatery into a promising establishment. McLamour's competent management soon made the cafeteria one of the most popular places in the city. It was there that he was noticed and invited to work at the round-the-clock fast food restaurant Colony All In. Two years later, he found himself at a restaurant called Brecker Breach, where he had a stake in the business. Concurrently, McLamour worked at McDonald's, where he had a brilliant idea to create something similar but unique. He saw many flaws in the rapidly growing chain's operation, but as it was a national network, fixing the issues locally was impossible. He understood how to make the network operate better, but wasn't given the opportunity to do so. This planted an idea in his mind, one that might never have become a reality, if he hadn't met another Cornell graduate, David Ross, in the early years. David Ross, born on May 26, 1927, was the younger of two children of David Edgar Ross, a wandering hotel operator, and Blaine Berger, a violinist. Initially dreaming of becoming a filmmaker, David's military service changed his aspirations, leading him to a career as a restaurateur. After graduating from Cornell University, he enrolled at Northwestern University, where he ventured into pie production, primarily selling pies on campus. While this small business was profitable, it didn't bring in the income he desired. His first official job was as an accountant at the Albert Picks Hotel Group in Chicago. 
After a period there, he received a tempting offer to become a manager at Howard Jones's restaurants. In a hurry to move to Miami, there seemed to be no obstacle for Dave in 1953. He coincidentally found himself in Jacksonville, where while strolling along the waterfront one evening, he noticed a building under reconstruction that closely resembled an ad guard near the entrance. He saw a franchise for ice cream called Queen, which David planned to acquire. Soon approaching closer, he struck up a conversation with two men who turned out to be businessmen, Kit Kramer and Matthew Burns, also owners of the building. They were planning to open a small restaurant called Insta Burger, specializing in self-service and offering a menu of hamburgers and milkshakes priced at only 18 cents each. Both businessmen were well aware of the success story of McDonald's and believed they could create something similar, especially since machines capable of automating not only the production of milkshakes, but also hamburgers had appeared in California. Intrigued by the technology, Kramer and Burns met George Reed, the inventor in person to see how the machine worked, impressed by its capabilities. They wasted no time in signing a contract, committing to open the restaurant. They decided not to delay the business model which would resemble that of McDonald's. The interior of Instaburger was equipped in the same style as McDonald's, as they both felt instinctively that the idea would work. They hoped Reed's technology for automating burgers and milkshakes would give them a competitive advantage over McDonald's. The prefix Insta in the name was intended to kickstart the franchise sales with the guys believing that such a name would practically sell itself with each new establishment. Kramer and Burns were supposed to pay Barnes a 2% cut of daily sales from each of the opened locations. He agreed to provide the machines at a price below market value. However, what the businessman couldn't foresee at the time was how much trouble these machines would bring them. The equipment was about 1M wide and 70 centimeters long, consisting of 12 compartments for buns and patties, with baskets rotating around an electric infrared emitter for cooking. The machine frequently malfunctioned, requiring frequent shutdowns. The cocktail making machine, in contrast, worked surprisingly well so well that it simply froze, just as you were opening the Jackson restaurant. Barnes met with Dave several times. First, Dave wanted to obtain a license to use the Instaburger machine at Derek Wynn's spot, which he planned to open. Second, when he met with Kramer and Barnes, they had already laid the groundwork for the future Pence Burger, where milkshakes, fries and hamburgers were planned to be served. Therefore, Dave reconsidered opening Derek's. When he decided to join Kramer and Barnes's venture, it was Dave who came up with the idea of creating an image of a king seated on a hamburger, holding a large milkshake. Eventually, a large four-meter Burger King ad with the king sitting on a burger adorned the entrance. Of course, Barnes decided to tweak the name a bit, adding, Ken 100 Burger to become Burger King. Nevertheless, Dave didn't receive anything from this creativity. Who knew that this little restaurant was destined to become Burger King? one of the most popular and well-known brands globally. After some time, Dave signed a contract with Kramer and Barnes to open a similar Insta Burger King in Miami. However, when the documents were ready, he panicked, realizing he catastrophically lacked funds because opening such a large restaurant alone was a foolish and costly venture. He urgently needed a partner who would share the costs and help build the business. James McClamour became that person. One April evening, James visited Dave at his invitation to see the little venture. They had known each other since university. James was impressed by the ambience and lighting of the premises and immediately felt he should contribute to the development of the small restaurant. However, there was one obstacle holding James back from taking on the new project. He needed to quit his job at Brickle Bridge and sell his stake. It was a risky endeavor and he needed to consider everything carefully. For several days, James couldn't sleep and was about to decline the offer. Besides selling his business, he also needed to move to Miami, meaning leaving his home where he had lived for almost 20 years. Imagine yourself in his shoes, having your own home, a place where you've spent half of your life, acquaintances, friends, and of course a stable business that brings consistent income. On the other hand, there was an adventure. I'm even more than sure that 99% of us would never dare to take such a step. But James caught himself thinking that if he didn't try, he would regret it for the rest of his days. In the end, he decided to take the plunge. On June 1st, 1954, 
James McLemore invested his $20,000 from selling his shares in Brickell Oldridge and founded Burger King of Miami Corporation with David Edgerton. According to the agreement, the business was divided 50, 50, and the restaurant resembled McDonald's but had its own features. For example, the prices at the new establishment were slightly higher, but there was a focus on the quality of the prepared dishes, ensuring that the nutritional value of the beef was maximally preserved during cooking, indicating a concern for the health of the customers. The first three years went reasonably well, but there was barely enough money to maintain the restaurants, let alone talk about any extra profit. Something needed to change because competing with McDonald's, which was opening its restaurants almost every day, was difficult. However, they needed something unique, something that others didn't have, and certainly not McDonald's. That's when James had a brilliant idea to play on the American mentality. He simply thought about what he himself was missing, namely a big sandwich at an affordable price. So instead of three sandwiches or one for two people, they quickly introduced an original dish called the Whopper. The enormous sandwich instantly became popular with all visitors, and by 1958, the brand was rapidly gaining popularity. Just a year later, to reinforce the success of the business, the founders decided on an original marketing move to shoot a company commercial specifically at the Whopper. This was not the only appearance on television for Burger King. The brand regularly created new ads and aired them for everyone to see. Each new commercial significantly boosted the company's ratings. But that was then. At the time, it was quite costly and a new venture. However, it was precisely because of this that just a few days later, nearly the entire state knew about Burger King. The establishment quickly gained popularity and many visitors came specifically to try the famous Whopper. At some point, the restaurant couldn't keep up with the influx of customers and James and Dave realized that luck had finally smiled on them. It was becoming too crowded in Miami, so the partners decided to expand. They needed to figure out how to do it. And after considering all possible business development concepts, they preferred franchising. After all, it required minimal investment and effort on their part. Thus, the Burger King Corporation was registered and the first restaurant franchises appeared on the market. What followed was a whirlwind. It took just eight years to open 274 establishments under their logo. The brand's popularity grew rapidly and in 1967, the founders suddenly decided that it was time to reap the maximum benefit and sell all rights to the brand. The deal was valued at a whopping $18 million, an astronomical sum at the time. Moreover, they owned only one restaurant. All the others belonged to franchisees. Deep down, the partners knew that at just 40 years old, they hadn't said their last word in the business world. With the huge amount of money they received, they could realize themselves in other directions. So, in 1967, the partners signed an agreement to sell the company and left it. It's hard to say whether this decision benefited Burger King, as a change in ownership led to accelerated opening of new restaurants, which significantly affected the quality of the food and, of course, the service. Despite beautiful advertising campaigns promising consistency and a pleasant family atmosphere, they didn't guarantee equality in the cost of products across all establishments. Many mistakes were made, and the new owners simply couldn't manage the vast number of restaurants. As a result, the company found itself on the brink of bankruptcy within a few years. The situation needed urgent correction, and former McDonald's manager Donald Smith stepped in to handle it. The new company management unleashed Smith's hands. He strengthened control over the establishments, introduced surprise inspections, and focused all efforts on standardizing the restaurants. Smith also introduced new technology that hadn't been seen before in any establishment. Every customer could now build their own burger, adding whatever they desired. Donald's management had a positive impact on the company and all its franchises. Firstly, he not only expanded Burger King restaurants across all states, but also introduced the franchise far beyond the borders of the USA. Secondly, under his leadership, drive throughs known as King of the Road, appeared allowing motorists to place orders without leaving their cars. Additionally, several details were considered that played a role in development and increased customer loyalty. As the restaurant was family-oriented in 1977, the company introduced a feature that is still present today. Burger King offered a toy with every purchase, attracting even more customers. 
In 1978, the menu was significantly expanded. All of this helped the company restore its position and even enter the top five most popular fast food chains in the USA. Donald Smith's mission was accomplished by the early 1980s, when he decided to step down as CEO, after which the company faced another crisis. The new owners struggled to manage the complex business, but in 1989, a decision was made to sell Burger King. Its new owner became the Green Metropolitan Company. The majority of the company's privileges, however, went to its new manager, Barry Gibbons. Although Burger King was not in the best shape, he managed to implement successful reforms. For several years, Barry focused on catering to children's needs, introducing new commercials featuring popular cartoon characters and establishing the Kids Club. These innovations not only increased the number of visitors, but also brought joy to young customers, thereby improving the brand's rating. In the early 2000s, the company changed hands again, this time partially. Several American organizations and companies, including Bain Capital Partners, Texas Pacific Group and Goldman Sachs, became the new owners. Since 2010, Burger King has been under the leadership of the global investment firm 3G Capital, which remains its sole owner to this day. Competent management has taken the company to a new level, significantly expanding its boundaries. For example, according to data from 2016, the corporation has over 15,000 fast food establishments and serves more than 11 million customers daily. Moreover, these figures continue to grow annually. Many specialists even predict that Burger King will eventually triumph over its main opponent, McDonald's. However, knowing this, the latter shows no signs of backing down. In Central Asian countries, the first Burger King restaurant opened only in 2010. And since then, the chain has been steadily growing opening several dozen new locations annually. Statistics show a significant advantage in Burger King's growth over other competitors, and this is far from its limit. Of course, I cannot leave the main question unanswered. Burger King or McDonald's? With a smile, the world has been watching their rivalry for several years now, a battle for leadership that sometimes gains significant publicity and even leads to legal disputes. For example, the case involving a Burger King advertisement featuring Sarah Michelle Gellar, known as Buffy the Vampire Slayer, was a telling example of the competitor's war. When the girl was just six years old, she appeared in a Burger King commercial, claiming that their burger contained 20% more meat than McDonald's. Several years later, the court ruled against the actress, as well as the advertising agencies and Burger King itself, for slander, imposing hefty fines. Moreover, in the 1980s, both companies rushed to assure customers that their products were juicier and tastier. Burger King claimed their items were prepared on a grill, while McDonald's used a regular frying pan. This led to another scandal and mutual accusations. Surprisingly, even in beverage suppliers, there was a difference. McDonald's offered exclusively Coca-Cola products, while Burger King went with Pepsi, a distinction that remains to this day. As for the founders of the company, after leaving Burger King, their story continued. James McLemore invested his money in Dolphins in Miami, a professional football club. In 1980, he was elected chairman of the University of Miami and worked with Ted Futami on financing the third largest company to date, resulting in the university raising $517 million. He also developed an interest in gardening and was involved in it both at home and in the tropical botanical gardens for children. In 1988, when Metropolitan bought Burger King as a result of a hostile takeover, the then CEO of Burger King asked McLemore to return to support the company with his advice and consultation. James returned and gave speeches at the National Franchisee Association conferences in San Francisco and Orlando. During the restoration of cooperation with Burger King, Jim wrote his autobiography. Burger King, Jim McLemore and the Building of an Empire was published posthumously in 1998. Later, the book was edited and reissued as Burger King, a grand story of life and leadership of the McLamour family in 2020. James passed away from cancer in Coral Gables, Florida, on August 8, 1996, at the age of 70, leaving behind an inheritance of nearly $100 million USD. If James retired from the restaurant business, David, on the other hand, after 12 years at Burger King, founded the Bodega Steakhouse restaurant chain, which was located throughout Florida, Chicago and Troy, and later sold them in 1978. 
In 1985, he opened new restaurants in San Francisco and Monterey, which he also later sold. David passed away on April 3, 2018, at the age of 90 in his beloved Miami, Florida. When asked what was the most memorable thing in their lives, both founders always said, the most memorable thing in our lives is Burger King. Are you familiar with Burger King restaurants? Which fast food restaurant do you prefer personally? Feel free to share your opinion in the comments. But for today, that's all. If you enjoyed the video, please rate it. And until next time, goodbye.